Big shocker in Wyandotte County as Mayor Reardon calls it quits. Also this week, the state chief justice and the clash over judges in Kansas. Plus, if you live in Kansas City, Missouri, are you ready to head back to the polls, this time to vote on a health tax? And why enjoying the Overland Park Arboretum now comes at a price. Greetings everyone, those stories and more coming up on The Place that works hard to try and connect the dots for you on the significant local stories in the news we are told are supposed to be important but sometimes we don't always fully understand why. Here to help us make sense of it all from the Kansas City Star nationally syndicated columnist Mary Sanchez, freelance reporter Sam Zeff who is working with KCPT now on a series of public policy stories including a big story this week on Medicaid expansion which we'll dissect later in the program. Also with us, the star's chief political correspondent, Steve Kraske, who also finds time to keep us up to date weekday mornings at 11 on KCUR. And star reporter, blogger and columnist, Dave Helling. Now, in a city that doesn't have many instantly recognizable local politicians, Joe Reardon has been one of our Metro's most familiar faces. But after being a fixture on the political landscape for the better part of a decade, the mayor of Wyandotte County in Kansas City, Kansas, announced this week he's calling it a day. Less than eight weeks before he was to face voters in his bid for re-election as mayor, Reardon abruptly decided he will not seek another term. He says he wants to spend more time with his family. But is there more to it than that, Steve Kransky? Well, I think, Dick, at this point, you sort of have to take him at his word. Uh, there was a sense leading up to the holidays that the mayor was going to seek a third term. That was the expectation going forward. But then the holidays hit, and to hear him talk about it in an interview with Dave uh, just the other day, he, the holidays came, and he began to reconsider looking at his family, looking at his young kids. Uh, he said that his oldest kid, uh, four years from now, will be on the brink of going to college. That's a whole lot of time uh, away from his father as he spent, his dad spending so much time being mayor. So I think all of that played into Joe Reardon's decision. But the election, as I said, is just in the end of February. Absolutely. He already has an opponent. Nathan Barnes, mm -hmm. a unified governor, government commissioner, has already filed for that office. And people know Nathan's name, and I think it's going to make for a very interesting election, that's for sure. Um, I don't think we should do too much about picking apart why Reardon decided not to run again. I mean, the aspect that is very, very personal that he has talked about a little bit of his father dying um, at such a young age mm -hmm. that he is one year from, those sorts of anniversaries play upon people in large ways. So, you know, I respect him. I think he's done a great job as mayor over there. He kept the momentum going that Carol Marinovich started and be an interesting election now. Anything more that we should be looking into this decision, Dave Helling? No, I, I again, I, I did talk with the mayor, and I take him at face value. I also don't think, you, you've heard some suggestions this week, uh, Nick, that he might be thinking about running for Congress or running for governor. I just don't think that, in long conversations with Mayor Reardon over the years, I just don't think he has that kind of fire in the belly, that sort of focus on a big political career. He may yet pursue it, but you don't get the sense that he wakes up in the morning thinking to himself, how can I you know, achieve the next office on the on the ladder. Let me throw in quickly, Mark Holland also filed this week to run, so we now have at least Nathan Barnes and Mark Holland. Anne Regia says she's interested in running for the post. Several other names have been mentioned. David Haley, I think, came up, Chris Steiniger and others. So it should be a wide open field, and there was some suggestion that the mayor, Joe Reardon, waited as long as he did because he didn't want this kind of 12 person field. The, the, the suggestion was that he actually went a little earlier than he thought he was going to go, in part because Steve was able to get the story. A, a, and so you're going to see a wide open field for mayor, I think, in Kansas City, Kansas, Wyandotte County. It should be an interesting race. Let's put those names, by the way, on the screen right now of those people that uh, who might be vying to fill his shoes. They do include, as Dave Helling mentioned, you've got there on the screen Nathan Barnes, uh, Mark Holland. We do have there Anne McGeer. Uh, also, State Senator David Haley and Chris Steiniger all mentioned these are state senators that were also vying to become. Does anyone have a leg up, by the way, as a bigger, or, or are there bigger names still weighing this race at this point in time? You know, I, the names you hear the most about uh, right now, Nick, are Mark Holland and Amber Gia, two very well-known 
uh, commissioners over there. I think, you know, it's, it, the race is very, very early here. We don't know what the entire field is going to be. But, but what we do know right now of these candidates, I think Mergia and Holland are going to be at the top of most people's lists uh, in the early soundings of where this race is Sam Seth, what do you think Joe, Joe Ridden's legacy has been in Wyandotte County? I think Mary was right that uh, really continued the uh, the momentum that started out uh, where the racetrack is. Uh, you know, I lived away from here for a number of years, and you come back, and every time you come back, there's a little something extra out there that's been added. Uh, and Kansas City, Kansas, I think, has become a boomtown, uh, and I think that's part of his legacy. I'd be interested to hear whether or not Joe Reardon is going to get some pressure from the party uh, in Kansas to run for a bigger office because they really have a dearth of stars. Yeah, I think he's had that pressure before and he's proved himself immune to it uh, to a large degree. There, there was real pressure for him to go, run against Kevin Yoder in the third district. There is, uh, There has always been, Nick, discussion about uh, uh, Joe Reardon as a potential gubernatorial candidate in very, very Republican Kansas. But again, you don't get the sense talking to him that somehow he thinks moving up the ladder is something that he's really that interested in. He may run again, but it wouldn't be because he's ambitious in that way. In your story, too, Steve Kraske, you had it mentioned that uh, he has a job. Uh, lined up here, but he's unwilling to make an announcement about that. Well, he hasn't announced it yet, but you certainly got the sense from the interview. Again, Dave conducted it that he has something sort of in the works here uh, down the road. He'll announce it uh, once we move past this uh, flurry of activity with uh, his future plans. But you do get the sense he has something else lined up, and we're ha going to have to just be patient and find out C what it can is. Can I say very quickly one more thing? The the next mayor of Kansas City, Kansas, Wyandotte County, faces enormous challenges because I think Sam is right. The the, the leg legacy of Joe Reardon is a good one, but it isn't finished. They're going to get enormous, an enormous windfall of revenue once the bonds are paid off for the Legends uh, uh, development project, and they're going to have to decide whether to spend that money on tax relief. Taxes remain very high in Wyandotte County, or whether they'll uh, address it to ne neglected neighborhoods, ne sidewalks, streets, that kind of thing. There is still anger in some parts of Kansas City, Kansas, that the benefits of Western Wyandotte County haven't really filtered down into the central part of that city. So the next mayor will have uh, enormous challenges, enormous issues to face. It's going to be an important election in that community. I can't emphasize that enough. The, there is this split in the county. So much success out west. The people who live in the core of Kansas City, Kansas, want to enjoy some of the benefits of all that success. So far, Nick, they haven't seen much of that, and they want it, and they want it yeah. soon. And what is Sly James going to do now, Mary Sanchez? Is he, isn't he going to need another stage partner? They have been a little bit of a double act, haven't they, over these years? Well, with the, the Google really solidified that relationship when they came together um, across the state line to promote the Google Fiber. I think, you know, Sly is a smart politician. He's going to go with whoever wins election over there, unless for some reason it becomes some sort of antagonistic um, relationship, which I just can't see. I mean, he basically needs to be what I think. The mayor of KCMO needs to be a champion of KCK's mayor as well, because they, like it or not, you know, state line is just one little road, and we are connected, so he'll do that. If you thought the fight over what so many now refer to as Obamacare was over, it is not. It has simply moved to state capitals. While the Supreme Court upheld most of the Affordable Care Act, it is left up to states whether to expand Medicaid. Medicaid expansion is going to be one of the most contentious issues lawmakers wrestle with in Topeka and Jefferson City as their legislative sessions get underway in both states. Now, if you haven't been following the story, the Affordable Care Act expands Medicaid, the government's low-income health care program, to individuals and families, making up to 138 percent of the federal poverty level. Now, under the act, the federal government would cover 100 percent of the costs of the newly eligible recipients for three years. And even after that, states would pick up no more than 10 percent of the costs. Advocates say it's a good deal. But on last night's The Local Show on KCPT, reporter Sam Zeff also spoke with critics who were worried about those 10 percent of costs and what those could mean for a state like Missouri into the future as hundreds of thousands of people are added to the Medicaid rolls. I don't see how you can look at this, look at what the Hospital Association put out, and I've seen their study. And it's a, it's a nice study. It was put together at the University of Missouri. It's a great study. But you're looking at something, you're going to try to go forward eight years and project something eight years down the road. I just got out of a meeting about two weeks ago trying to predict 
the consensus revenue figure for the state of Missouri going forward 18 months. And we had a lot of discussion and a lot of, a lot of discussion on what that's going to mean. And that's an 18 month figure. Now we're talking, the hospital association is talking going out eight years. Hard to believe? I think so. And there's even less believing in Kansas. The more that we start giving anything away free, in this case health care, the, the money that that's going to cost is going to come out of school funding. It's going to come out of other social service programs. Or it's going to come out in the form of much higher taxes, which is going to have an economic impact of reducing jobs. You can see the entire local show story on KCPT Sunday at 5.30 or on KCPT's YouTube channel. Let's start in Missouri, though. The governor says, let's do this. What about the Republican-controlled legislature, Steve Kraske? Well, so far, a lot of resistance uh, to going forward with this. But I just would add that the Speaker of the House, even though he has spoken out very strongly against this idea, he is keeping the door open, Nick, by the formation of a committee designed to look at different options going forward when it comes to shaping this package that uh, might make it acceptable to Republicans going forward. So early soundings, it doesn't look good. It's going to be a very, very hard fight for Governor Nixon. One of the pivotal moments of his eight years in office will be this fight, but it's going to be very tough. Sam? Uh, Steve is right, although I think, what, uh, I think what the proponents have going for them is a ground game plan that uh, is detailed and involves a lot of people. As we mentioned, uh, it's the Chamber of Commerce uh, is for this, the Kansas City Chamber of Commerce is for this, uh, Hospital Association is clearly for uh, primary mm -hmm. care. Because uh, they're arguing this will also create jobs, aren't they? Right, 24,000 jobs uh, and uh, $9 billion in the economy. Interesting thing about the Hospital Association, their ground game is planned out uh, district by district. Uh, they can go to each representative or each senator and say, listen, Medicaid expansion means this to your rural hospital or this to your, uh, to your clinic. Uh, and, I, and they really believe that they can swing enough votes uh, going district to district saying, here's what's good about it and get this thing to pass. Dave. The biggest problem in Missouri, and it's also the biggest problem in Kansas politically, isn't really the facts and figures because Sam's right. I think lobbying groups are sort of saying you would add X amount of jobs. This revenue wouldn't really cost you anything. The biggest problem legislatively is the visceral hatred of the Affordable Care Act. Logic and facts and figures don't really f figure into the debate. I don't mean that in a pejorative way. There are people who just don't want to do anything that is seen as an endorsement of what they call Obamacare, and that's really the hurdle for Republicans both in Missouri and Kansas okay. to get over. So we, we talked about it in Missouri, so is that the same then in Kansas, you believe? Yeah, very Steve? much so, but again, Governor Sam Brownback, a very conservative governor, has left the door open, hasn't closed the door to the idea of advancing and moving ahead with this expansion. Now, trying to pass something like this through that legislature, even perhaps more conservative than you find in Missouri, again, a very, very difficult task, Nick. Okay. Sam, no. the benefits, though, I mean, we just talked about the critics there in your larger story that you can see again on 530 on Sunday from the local show, if you didn't see that whole report. <laughs> I mean, the, the benefits, though, I mean, obviously, they're going to say these are going to be healthier individuals. Yes. It's going to benefit hundreds of thousands of people if they were on this, on the expansion of Medicaid. Yes. Um, they, they claim also it would increase the number of jobs in Missouri and Kansas, but the skeptics are still there that they don't believe the numbers. Uh, I think that uh, there is some of the non-believing, but I really believe it boils down to exactly what Dave said. There is a visceral hatred of anything that has uh, Obamacare attached to it. Uh, I think that's going to be the most difficult hurdle in both uh, the Missouri General Assembly and with Governor Brownback, who makes the decision in Kansas. Is there more to it than that, Mary? Well, I think that's the bottom line of it, but what they need to, as far as the backlash, but what people also do recognize, whether they state it or not, is that we have an awful lot of people who do not have health care, and it is extremely costly to the economy. People know that. Politicians know that. So when they get pushed, they're going to have to deal with that reality. Well, the governor of Kansas, by the way, having been beaten up for on other stories for eroding what they claim is, is eroding of the safety net, uh, even blocking Medicaid expansion, uh, announcing this week a major mental health initiative, backing it up with money. The governor, prompted in part by the massacre at Sandy Hook Elementary School, said his administration will spend $10 million 
to treat Kansas's most serious cases of mental illness. Now, what are we to read into this latest announcement? Well, I, was, I was at the news conference yesterday, talked with the governor about this. He thought, he thinks, that this money, which by the way isn't new money, it's just really shifted from other parts of the, of the uh, health care uh, budget, uh, will allow mental health centers in Kansas to more quickly address highly uh, risky mentally ill patients, which he thinks are responsible for events like Columbine and, and Sandy Hook. Um, it, but it's also, uh, I asked him directly, Nick, well, if you're so concerned about mental illness, how about expanding Medicaid? A lot of the Medicaid expansion would pay for mental health counseling, and he said he wasn't really to, uh, ready to make that decision yet. That's when we'll know how committed it, uh, the governor really is to mental health issues, it seems. But isn't this a significant gesture, Mary? It's a gesture. Um, and it's a gesture that I would applaud because it is a gesture. However, if you look at the long-term history, Kansas is like a lot of states, and they have just decimated mental health care by cuts and cuts and cuts over really about the last decade. So it's a great gesture, but wait and see. Sam. Yeah, Mary's right. Back in 2007, uh, there was a $27 million fund for mental health in Kansas. That's been cut back last year to 15 million, so this is going to help a little bit. Uh, but the fact is that uh, funding for mental health care in Kansas has gone way down uh, over the last uh, 10 years, and Medicaid expansion would do a lot. Just getting people on meds uh, would do a lot to, to do a lot to help. You know, from my vantage point, Nick, there's a political component here. This is a governor who was seen as being a governor who cuts and cuts and cuts. Now he's coming out and you know seemingly sticking money, new money in a in a different in a different place. There's some benefit for him, showing some compassion, showing that he is aware of some of these broader social needs that Sam rightly points out have gone ignored and neglected for so many years in Kansas. So he gets a little bang for the buck, I think, politically by coming out in favor of something here as he heads into the session. But, and this also, though, is a way of being able to say he's doing something that doesn't actually involve guns. Isn't that part of it, too? Well, right. And, of course, we asked him, well, what about guns? What about the violence in the media? What about some of the other issues that uh, people have raised in the wake of that massacre out in, in, in Connecticut last December? His argument was, well, you can't do guns quickly. You can't really get at the violence in movies and video games quickly. This is a quick step. But really, the, as my colleagues have suggested, Nick, the proof will be in the pudding. $10 million is a drop in the bucket. The community health centers say they're glad to have it, beats a poke in the eye with a stick. But the proof will come in the next 90 days uh, when Kansas decides whether or not it will accept all this money from the federal government for Medicaid that could help the mental health picture dramatically. We seem to be talking a lot about health care on this program this weekend. Here's another health care related story. The Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare as people like to call it, was supposed to support those left behind in the current health care system. So why is City Hall in Kansas City, Missouri, getting ready to put on the ballot a renewal of a health care tax this April for the indigent and not a stopgap measure until the Affordable Care Act gets fully up and running in 2014. But this would be for the next nine years. The health care tax would add $43 to the property tax bill of a $100,000 home. You happen to write this story, Dave. So why is this necessary? Well, proponents say it is necessary because Obamacare won't be enough, that it will provide some insurance for the poor but not e cover everyone particularly, and without sounding like a broken record, particularly if Missouri doesn't expand Medicaid. There will not be insurance then for those at-risk populations. So they need that money. But even if they get Medicaid, they sort of say, we need this quote-unquote temporary tax. There's another tax that isn't on the ballot that provides uh, 20, 25 million dollars. I mean, the, the, you know, Kansas City taxpayers pay a lot of money for indigent health care in this community quite apart from what they do for Obama. But some people would be surprised to think that a city is actually doing this, but Steve? Well, the timing of this is very interesting because as we're talking about here this half hour, there is so much in flux when it comes to health care and what's going to happen in Missouri, what's the, what the shape of Medicaid is going to be going forward. And interestingly enough, Nick, it's, it's a task force at City Hall came up with a plan to extend this tax for four years, not the nine years being contemplated here. That's a big difference, and I think uh, voters are going to 
look at all this, perhaps with some skepticism, based on what's being trotted out here. Yeah. And it was Mark Funkhauser, if I recall, who said, why is the city even involved in, in funding health care? Well, well, and do they want to be uh, out of that business? Right. And this tax was originally passed in 2005 for precisely with the argument that give us nine years and we'll figure out how to get the region involved and get us out of this business. Instead, they've come back and said, no, give us another nine years in addition to the permanent tax, which has doubled over the last two decades. So Kansas Cityans have been very generous locally in, in health care for the poor. We'll see that tested, I think, in April. It's been traditional in Kansas for the Chief Justice of the Kansas Supreme Court to address a joint session of the legislature in making the annual State of the Judiciary speech. But not this year. Justice Lawton Nuss has been rebuffed and told by the Speaker of the House there's simply no time for him to make any remarks and instead to put his words in writing. The turn of events has been viewed as a major slight of the judiciary by the conservative tilting legislature, which is expected to take up within weeks a bill to change the way higher court justices are selected. The move would reverse a decades-old nominating system in favor of one in which the governor would get to handpick a candidate and then have his choice confirmed by the Senate. Can anyone around this table tell me what is behind this tension? How about juvenile? I mean, oh. at least... I, I didn't see not, that in my notes, but thank you, Mary. No, well, not letting him speak. I mean, come on. Everybody knows that there is there is this huge tension behind dealing with, you know, the whole terms activist judges and that they want to change the whole system, which you can always look at the systems of how judges are put into place. But to not let him even speak, it's like, come on, grow up. Do, deal with the other issues. Yes in a more, you know, But, the, but the House Speaker, Ray Merrick, who's from the Kansas yes. City area, said that lawmakers had come to him and said that the, 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 the speech was very boring over the years. It was well, a waste a of lot time. Of, there's no, a lot of boring want, things in the Kansas legislature. Nick, there is a lot of tension uh, yeah. between the judiciary in Kansas and lawmakers. I mean, it goes back to 2005 when the state Supreme Court ordered the spending of tens of millions of dollars on the school funding formula uh, lawmakers thought that was a direct imposition on the work that they do as activist judges. Just a year ago, there was a budget fight uh, with the courts and its budget. The courts shut down for a day in a very dramatic gesture of sort of protest against what the legislature was doing. The legislature didn't take very kindly to that either. And now we have this fight over how judges are picked. You can only begin to see here what's going on. A lot of tension in Kansas overall. And so the, the plan is to allow the governor then, in, in just like the federal system, where the president gets to pick the person he wants to be a Supreme Court justice, and then the Senate pick, and then the Senate confirms that person. What is wrong uh, then in the system in Kansas, then Sam Zeff, where the governor would get to pick who the uh, the judge on a court of appeals or the Supreme Court, and then the Senate would confirm that person? If it's good at the federal level, what's wrong at the state level? Well, opponents would say that uh, there's practical politics uh, involved. That in fact, Governor Brownback just wants to get his people on the Court of Appeals, uh, on the Supreme Court, a little bit harder to do, and that the Senate, as opposed to advising and consenting, would just be rubber stamping. Uh, and that's what opponents fear, is that this is a power grab uh, by Governor Brownback to control the appeals court in Kansas, ultimately uh, because of school, uh, because of school funding. Uh, and if I can just, just another second, this legislation is on a rocket sled. Uh, there's already a bill uh, pre-filed yesterday, Senator Jeff King from Independence, and they've modified their proposal a little bit. Uh, the original legislation last year, which died in the Senate, said governor uh, appoints, the Senate uh, would then confirm. This bill in the Senate would give you sort of a middle ground. So the governor would uh, make his appointment. It would go to a committee that uh, had various appointments on it. They would vet it in some way which is not specified. Then it would go to the Senate. Uh, where they would confirm. So it looks like they're trying to put a little political cover in this uh, between, uh, between the governor and the uh, conservative uh, Republican Senate in Kansas. Okay. So, but this, this, you said this is on a, a rocket sled, so this is moving very, very quickly. Would these changes, though, require, though, a vote of the people, or could the legislature unilaterally decide this and the voters would be kept out of the equation altogether? You can Steve? change the, the, the selection formula for the appellate court, Nick, just through a state law. With the state Supreme Court, it would require a constitutional amendment and people voting. Okay. But is this, as, as Sam suggested, Dave Helling, really about 
education? Yes, yes. Ultimately, it's about the, the case that Steve referred to back in 2005 where the court, in essence, really uh, increased funding for schools. Sam Brownback's budget will not work unless he can get a, a compliant court system to agree with the cuts that almost certainly are going to come. That may be some of the impetus and some of the movement behind it, but it's about every other sort of case that they want to abortion too. many other yes. issues this redoing of the doing appellate the same court thing we're so about this is one of those other issues yeah. we'll be continuing to follow yes. right here on Kansas City Weekly yes. Review yes. and finally visitors to the Overland Park Arboretum are now being greeted by a big surprise a ticket charge after more than two decades as a free attraction the 300 acre outdoor venue just off of 179th Street and 69 highway is now charging three dollars to enter a buck for kids thanks in part to the controversial over a bronze statue of a topless woman last year. It was the best ever for the Arboretum, which is trying to get visitors to think of themselves as more than just a park. If Powell Gardens charges 10 bucks for its 900 acres, is it fair, Mary, for the Arboretum to begin charging $3 for its 300 acres, or is that I, a stretch? I think it's fair. I mean, the $5 <laughs> that they looked at initially was a little bit high. $3 is easy. Sam, what do you think? I think it's cheaper than going to bazookas, but on the other hand, I think that uh, let, <laughs> the you know? in, let the people in, let the people in. Steve. Yeah, more new bronze, bronze statues might help drive the number down because more people will be going, Nick. Dave, you know? I have no comment. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Smart man. Very, very safe. From the star, Dave Helling, Sam Zeff, thank you so much for being with us. Steve Kraske, we look, also look forward to seeing you on Up to Date on KCUR. Thanks, Mary Sanchez, national syndicated columnist for the Kansas City Star, thank you for being with us on Week in Review. I'm Nick Haynes. From all of us here at KCPT, thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.